Good morning, everyone. And your pastor's going to invite you to stand to your feet. <laughs> you knew it was coming. Come on. <laughs> and uh, as you stand to your feet, don't go too far, okay? Don't stray too far, but turn around and shake someone's hand and greet them and smile at them. And yeah. Bless them. Before you take your seat again, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. You promised, Lord, that you would send the Holy Spirit who would take of the things of Jesus and show them to us. And so, Father, I ask for the fulfillment. I'm being cheeky and asking for the fulfillment of your promise today. In this place, Holy Spirit, please come and find open hearts. Take of the things of Jesus, of the Word, who is Jesus, and show them to us and feed us and transform us. We ask it in his name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Just before we continue, if I um, might say, sometimes, you know, uh, when we're going through a sermon, I put all the scriptures up and they come one after the other. And, and, but other times I wonder if doing that stops us from looking at the word for ourselves in your Bible. So today, Patrick's rushing to get Bibles, is he? No. <laughs> so if you've got your Bible with you, please open your Bible and have it with you. If you haven't got your Bible, you can see in the corners there are some Bibles um, and if they all go and you haven't got your Bible, you haven't got an A Bible, then sit next to someone who has or look over their shoulder. <laughs> Praise God. And we're going to start today with just one verse, but there will be plenty of verses to follow. The title of the message that the Lord's put on my heart this morning is No Shortcut to Glory. No Shortcut to Glory. John 6 and verse 15. So Jesus, knowing that they were about to take him, and make him their king by force, quickly left and went up the mountainside alone. Just so far. At this moment, in the life and ministry of Jesus, we have reached a point that could be described as peak popularity. Peak popularity. Think about it. The way Jesus fed the 5,000 would have solved the cost of living crisis. The way Jesus walked on water would have solved the transport workers crisis. The way Jesus healed people miraculously would have solved the NHS crisis. The way Jesus caused light to shine in the darkness would have solved the energy crisis. And the way Jesus taught Peter how to catch a fish with coins in its mouth to pay their tax bill would have solved the economic crisis. Jesus' Maury Pole figures would have been off the scale. 
at that point. If there had been a general election at that moment, Jesus would have won all 635 seats in Parliament. He would have been installed as Prime Minister, Chancellor, Foreign Secretary, Home Affairs Minister, and the new monarch all by the end of the day. <laughs> he is so popular at this point, so popular, that people want to take him by force to Jerusalem and proclaim him king. But Jesus refuses the opportunity. And it marks a watershed in his popularity. It's all downhill after this. First, his followers, we started to look at that a couple of weeks back. First, his followers started turning back in John 6 to the point where Jesus actually says to Peter, uh, uh, are you also going to turn back? And then in John 7, verses 1 to 5, we won't look at it in today, we'll just mention it, but in John 7, 1 to 5, we see Jesus' own stepbrothers suggest he should go public in Jerusalem with his miracles and healing when they know full well that the Jews are trying to kill him. In other words, his own stepbrothers were trying to set him up. Why don't you go and do all this? Because it, it says at the end there in verse 5, they didn't believe in him yet. <laughs> so why were they suggesting that? Well, because if Jesus had gone public right at that moment and gone to Jerusalem, they would have killed him right there and then. There's a nice stepbrothers for you. <laughs> but don't be too hard on them. One of them was James. He later served the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Finally, the Jews and the Gentiles conspire together to kill Jesus. The one, the one who they would have taken that day and installed as king ends his life a pitiful sight, bruised, bloodied, beaten, and broken. Instead of going to a glorious coronation, Jesus goes to an ignominious crucifixion. They had wanted to make him king, and he had turned away. It raises the question, why? Why? Why didn't Jesus let them crown him king that day? Wasn't that what he had come for? To be our king? Didn't the Father send him to establish the kingdom? and take his rightful place as king of kings and lord of lords. Indeed, that was exactly what the father had promised Jesus all along, that he would be king. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 10, says this, I have installed, these are all prophecies in the Old Testament, I have installed my king on Zion my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Psalm 110, verses 1 to 2. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will uh, extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Daniel 7 Verses 13 to 14. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days 
and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power and all peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And Zechariah 14 and verse 9, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name, the only name. And dozens of Old Testament prophecies spoke of this Messiah, this Prince of Peace whom God sends, being crowned king over all the earth, ruling with justice and fairness. Isaiah says the kings of the earth will bow before him. Isaiah said that there would be no end to the increase of his government. And Isaiah said the nations would come to the brightness of his rising, Isaiah 60. And yet here, in John 6 and verse 15, they want to fulfill that destiny. They want to take Jesus make him king, crown him king, but Jesus refuses the chance, the opportunity to be crowned king. He refuses to fulfill his destiny. And you know, it wasn't even the first time that he had refused such an offer. In the temptation in the wilderness, we read that Satan also made such an offer to Jesus and he refused that one as well. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant. Now remember, this is, this is Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry. He's, on, he's only just started. This is the first thing he's doing. And it's as if the devil is trying to preempt everything here. And so takes him up. And, and makes this offer to him. It says, he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God, serve him only. So why did Jesus refuse these opportunities to fulfill his destiny and be crowned king? My friends, quite simply, because it wasn't the right way. It wasn't the right way. You know, when Satan said to him, I, I can give this to anyone I want, just worship me, it'll all be yours. Jesus said, it is written, worship the Lord. Jesus could easily have said, oh, it will be mine. Oh, it will be mine, make no mistake. But not this way. Not via you. Via my father, via my father. That's how it will come. Quite simply, Jesus Satan's offer, you see, Satan's offer and the people's offer to crown Jesus king was the right end, but not by the right means. It was the right destination, but not the right route. In the economy of God's kingdom, the end never justifies the means. The end never justifies the means in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, the way things are done is all important. It's all important. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. You see, Jesus knew he would get his kingdom, but he knew he had to go first to the cross. He knew he would get his kingdom,
but he, had, but he had to go via the cross. It would come through humble obedience. There could be no shortcuts on this. There could be no shortcuts. If it was to be God's kingdom, then it had to be God's way. If it was to be God's kingdom, listen carefully, if it's to be God's kingdom, it has to be God's way. Otherwise, it's not his kingdom. Otherwise, it's not his kingdom. If it was to be God's kingdom, it had to be done God's way so that it would reveal the heart and the love of God. Isaiah 16 and verse 5. Beautiful scripture. It says, in love, a throne will be established. This is a prophecy speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings, who would come. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. One from the house of David, one who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. In love, a throne will be established. Not in expedience, not in convenience, not in pride, not for selfish reasons, but in love. Before Jesus could get the kingdom, he had to go to the cross. Before he could get the kingdom, he had to go to the cross. And Jesus also knew before if he was to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, he first had to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 5, verses 2 to 6. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll. This is the scroll of history. This is the responsibility for the history of humanity and the history of the earth and all the peoples. No one was found who was worthy to open that and take responsibility. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And at that point, can you imagine, what would you have been expecting to turn around and see at that moment Someone like Aslan <laughs> with a magnificent mane, a lion roaring. And so he turns to look and it says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. You know, Jesus would eventually be crowned king, king of kings, lord of lords. Revelation 11 and verse 15 says the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. But it had to be via the cross. That way, the love of God is revealed. And Jesus is the lion. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Worthy to open, worthy to take responsibility for the scroll of human history. But when you look for the lion, you will first see the lamb. When you look for the lion, the first one you'll see is the lamb. As if it had been slain, standing in the midst of the throne. Why? Why? Because that way reveals the selfless, self-giving, sacrificial love of God. That's the foundation of his kingdom. That's who he is. If it's God's kingdom, it has to be God's way. 
not man's way. It has to be God's way. Jesus, after humbling himself, doing the will of the Father, after being obedient to death, even death on the cross, and the Father said to him, sit now at my right hand while I fulfill my promise and make your enemies your, make your, enemies your footstool. The way of God, my friends, the way of God is rooted in humble obedience. Humble obedience born of selfless love. Jesus said many times, and I'm going to touch on this in greater depth next week, Jesus said many times, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. I've come to do your will, Father, he said many times. He knew, Jesus knew his reward would come, but it would come through humble obedience to the will of the Father. Not through bowing down to Satan and taking that shortcut, not to letting a mob go and make him king, not through that shortcut, but through the expression of the selfless agape love of God, humble obedience and trust in the Father would lead to everything that the Father promised coming to pass. That's the way. In his prayer to the Father, just before going to the cross, Jesus said in John 17 and verse 4, I can't, I've got to be honest with you, I can't wait to get to John 17. You know, that's one of, the, <laughs> one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. The prayer of Jesus is so much revealed in the prayer of Jesus before he went to the cross. But in, in verse 4 of chapter 17, he says, I've glorified you on the earth by faithfully doing everything you've told me to do. And in the very next breath, he says, now, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you from the beginning. Now, Father, glorify me. In other words, Jesus glorified the Father. He highlighted the Father. He expressed and exposed the love of the Father by humble obedience and trust. And then the Father could glorify him and crown him king, raise him from the dead and crown him king for all eternity. You know, Peter didn't quite get it at first. It's quite interesting when you, when you follow some of these themes and, uh, and ideas that are revealed in, in the gospel uh, of John and you realize that different ones did get it, uh, uh, others didn't. Peter didn't quite get it at first. You know, in Matthew 16 and Mark 8, when Jesus spoke of the fact that he had to suffer many things and of being killed and having to go to the cross, Peter, uh, Jesus spoke of that, and Peter tried to deter him and said, oh, no, no, that's, that, that can't be. And he was severely rebuked. He was severely rebuked. Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus said to him, you savor not the things of God, but the things of man. In other words, you savor not the way of God, but the way of man. You savor not the things of God, but the things of man. It was the same rebuke he'd given to Satan himself in that temptation in the wilderness. It was not God's way. Said Jesus rebuked Satan in the wilderness and said, you don't savor the things of God. You don't savor the way of God. You're in this for yourself. You're in this for what you can get out of it. It's pride and selfishness here. The way of God is humble obedience and trusting in his promise and his faithfulness. When Peter drew his sword in the garden to defend Jesus... It's not the way, you can just imagine, you know, I would love to have been a, I don't want to say a fly on the wall, but you know, I would love to have been there and seen Jesus' reaction to that. So, oh, Peter, put it away. You still haven't quite got this, have you? <laughs> That's not the way. It's not the way. It's not the way. It's humble obedience to the Father. Put the sword away. <laughs> 
It wasn't the way. Moses got it. Moses had understood it. You know, sometimes we wonder about why some of these people are, are considered the greats of Scripture uh, uh, throughout history. People like Abraham and Moses and David and, and uh, so on. And, but they got it. Moses got it. You know, he understood that God's way was even more important than what God was doing. It was the way he did it. Moses got it. Exodus 33 and verse 13. Moses says, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. I wonder how many of us these days, I mean, I, I get caught, I catch myself out in this so many times. There's so much I ask God that I'd like him to do. <laughs> how often do I ask God, Lord, I know you're doing wonderful things. Show me how, show me your way, show me your heart, show me your motivation. I want to know what makes you tick, Father. I want to understand that agape love that is at the heart of everything you are and everything you do. Because that's more important than anything. Moses said, Exodus 33, verse 13, if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you. Wow. And you know, David commented commented on that in Psalm 103. In Psalm 103 verses 6 to 8, David wrote this, he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Even that's interesting. He made his deeds known to the people of Israel, his acts, but to Moses he showed his ways. To Israel, he showed what he was doing, but to Moses, he was showing how he did it, the way he did it, why he did it. Who do you think got the better revelation? Moses. Why? Because Moses would have ended up knowing something more about God and being closer to God. And it's very interesting because you read that first bit in, in Psalm 103, verses 6 to 8. He made known his ways to Moses, says David, his deeds to the people of Israel. And then, have you noticed, he goes on to describe the ways that God showed Moses. Because in the very next verse, he says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Oh, so you see, it wasn't just a, a two-dimensional thing that God was, was showing uh, 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 to Moses here. It was, yes, he, he showed his acts to Israel, but Moses said, show me your ways. And so God revealed to Moses that the, the way he did things, the reason he did things, the why and the way was compassion and grace and slow to anger that's patience and long suffering abounding in love do you see the revelation of God coming do you see the revelation of God coming when you ask not just ask God to do something for you but you ask about the way and you ask about his motivations and you ask him about his heart and why and he delights in explaining. He'll delight in showing you. He just wants you to ask. <laughs> so that he would do that. And David himself, of course, got it. Often in the Psalms, you know already, I can see it's, it's I can just see by the looks on your faces that, that, that you're thinking of all the times in the Psalms that David said, teach me thy ways. Show me your paths. Teach me your ways, O oh Lord. We even used to do a song on that. I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. Make straight the path before me. So many times. And then you get to Psalm 86, verse 11, and David says this. Listen carefully. I'm reading it to you from the Passion Translation. David says, teach me more about you. How you work 
and how you move so that I can walk onward in your truth until everything within me brings honor to your name. There's a right way to do things. There's a God way to do things. There's a kingdom way to do things. My friends, there is life-changing truth here for us. Out of this simple verse in John 6 and verse 15, where Jesus turned away from fulfilling the destiny the wrong way and rather entrusted himself to God. It's a life-changing truth for us. You see, and, and you will know, I don't have to spell this out because every single person here today and every single person listening online, you will know of the opportunities that I speak when I say this to you. Satan will offer you shortcuts. Satan will offer you cheap shortcuts to get what God has promised. Men will say to you that you have to fight tooth and nail and do unto others before they do unto you to get what God has promised. But those shortcuts, those ways are not God's ways. They may look good to men, but they don't reveal the love of God. And they don't lead to the life of God being revealed. When you go God's way, when you trust and obey, then righteousness is your rear guard. Righteousness will guard you and guide you. All that he has promised will come to you. All he has promised you will come to you, but it will come the right way by his mighty hand as you humbly obey. If you would come after me, said Jesus, then deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. In other words, choose the cross, choose God's way, it leads to life. Jesus got his kingdom, but he had to go via the cross. Jesus is the lion of, of the tribe of Judah, but he was first and always will be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Choose the cross. Choose God's way. Then God's love is revealed and his life is revealed in you and through you. There is a better way. It's God's way. It's a better way. There's a better way to be an employee a better way to be a husband, a better way to be a wife, a better way to be a parent, a son, a daughter, a leader, a business person, a supervisor. There's a better way to be a success in life. It's God's way. It's God's way. No shortcuts. No shortcuts. Peter did get it in the end, by the way. He wrote in his first epistle, 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. He said, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. In other words, do it the right way, the righteous way. Trust God, humble obedience, and he will bring to pass in your life all that he has promised you. His love and mighty power are revealed through you obeying and him lifting you up and giving what he's promised, delivering you, promoting you. His mighty hand is not a mighty hand to humble you, it's a mighty hand to lift you and deliver you and bless you because you've trusted in him and not try to force it your own way or Satan's way or man's way. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Sometimes the way God asks us to go doesn't make sense. Have you ever been in that situation? The way that God has asked you to go, it kind of doesn't make sense. You think, oh, if I do that, ooh, (laughs) I, I could be in trouble there. I could lose out. This could happen. That could happen. Sometimes the way God asks us to go doesn't make sense. We fear the consequences. But I believe with all my heart we need to trust him, to choose the cross, to trust and obey. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in due time. Hebrews 10, verses 33 to 36 Sometimes, writes Paul, if it's Paul writing, (laughs) I think it is, but I, I don't know for certain. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property (laughs) hey this is getting heavy (laughs) wait a minute wait a minute this is the bible is it (laughs) (laughs) it's the way of god actually (laughs) you sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions so do not throw away your confidence It will be richly rewarded. Oh, now listen to the next line. This is the clincher. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. It's the consistent revelation of Scripture. To persevere so that when we have done the will of God, we will receive what he's promised. You know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes it says there, uh, you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. Um, we've got a real challenge on our hands at the moment because if you, if, you, if you stand up for what the Bible says in any number of areas at the moment, you're going to come in for some persecution and not a little insult either. Funnily enough, it was in the papers this week Did you read about the the vicar's wife in um, Surrey? Anyone read about that? The the Surrey police went and just about forced their way in and arrested her in front of her children, in front of the neighbours, because they said an LBGQ whoever feelings had been offended on a something that she had said on Twitter, and she hadn't even actually said it on Twitter. It wasn't her. And they arrested her. It turns out that actually that, that, that woman, I don't know if anyone else here signs up to these kinds of things, but I get regular emails from her. Her name's Caroline Farrow, uh, and um, because of the, they're always we're signing petitions and, and stuff. So it was quite funny that this week, the petition I had to sign was the petition to get the Surrey police to acknowledge their wrongdoing there and to apologize to a, a wife, a, a vicar's mum, a vicar's, uh, a mum and a vicar's wife um, who had just been so rudely and, and without grounds just uh, uh, arrested like that. She committed no crime. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. I don't know about you. It's very tempting to think at the moment, I'm just going to keep my head below the parapet. (laughs) I'm going to just keep my head below the parapet. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. If you get that email from Caroline Farrow and the, the, the stuff that she does to help Christians who are being persecuted for their faith in this country <laughs> as well as in other places, then stand, stand with her and sign that petition. You sympathized with those in prison 
and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Whew, this is a hard way. But you know, because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. The, the day you die, your house will be gone. You can't take it with you. I'm not saying we should go and throw our properties away or whatever. I'm just saying that when it comes to the stuff that really matters in eternity, there are things more important than bricks and mortar. Because we know ourselves and we've got better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence. That's the temptation, isn't it? That we lose confidence. It gets to the point where we're not confident that we're going to be richly rewarded when we're facing the trouble. But that last line, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. I'm going to stop there. and I just want to say this morning, I would like to pray. I want to ask the prayer ministry team to come. And also, thank you, Jermaine. Just play, uh, but... I, when I was praying about this and preparing this word, I felt not only for myself, but that there would be many others, perhaps today, who you're facing situations of your wondering whether you should take a shortcut, or you're wondering whether you should go man's way to sort something out, or whether you should, dare I say, do something wrong to be able to get to the end because you believe the end will justify the means. No, it won't. My friends, do, do not cast away your confidence. Trust in the almighty God who is able to lift you up as you humbly obey. There is pain. There is pain. God never said it would be easy. For Jesus to choose the cross to get to the kingdom was not an easy route but it was the best route for Jesus to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world before he could be the lion of the tribe of Judah wasn't an easy route but it was the best route and whatever it is my friend you are facing, my brother, my sister, whatever it is you're facing, whether it's a work situation, whether you've been accused of something, whether you're the victim of an injustice and you're trying to think of how I can sort this out. No, you can't take a baseball club round and sort them out. <laughs> That's not God's way. Honestly, there are times I would like to do that in, in the flesh. There are some people I would like to sort out. You say, oh, Brendan, you're a pastor. How can you say something like that? Because I'm also a human being. And there are times there are people who are doing stuff and I think, oh, I would like to go and sort that person out. <laughs> but that's not, that's not God's way. And sometimes it's painful to go God's way because you have to swallow pride you have to pay a price. You have to forgive. You have to say sorry. Sometimes you can do nothing but just wait and say, God, I'm trusting you and this is nothing else I can do. I'm not going to go down that route. I'm not going to go down that route. I'm going to stick with your route on this. You're facing things like that. I'm asking you, please come. We can't sort it out for you in prayer. The prayer ministry team are wonderful. We've got wonderful, amazing brothers and sisters who pray for us. But actually, what they're doing and what I would do or what any of us would do is just stand with you. Stand with the, that scripture we read. Stand side by side. So you come, and we're going to do that Hebrews 10. We're going to just stand side by side with you today. You don't even have to tell us what the situation is. But let us just stand side by side with you and pray with you and encourage you and strengthen you that your heart be strengthened and encouraged that you walk out of here today knowing in your heart that you are obeying God, that you're going God's way, confident, confident that in due time he's going to lift you up.
and he's going to bless you. Shall we pray? Father, I pray for your word to be a word of life to our hearts today. And I know many, Lord, would be in the positions of needing such encouragement. And I pray and ask, Father, that as we pray and stand side by side, that, Lord, that we would just have a glimpse of your mighty hand to deliver us. That we would have a glimpse of who you are, of your love, of the reward, of the end that is so better than the beginning. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for encouragement for every life, every circumstance, every situation, every heart. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you'd like to come for prayer, now please come for prayer. If you want to go for tea, we've got tea outside. Um, but please respect the fact that we're praying alongside and standing shoulder to shoulder with some folks and praying for them today. But you come for prayer and we're going to just trust God together. In Jesus' name.